Spirit. This gospel passage is familiar to all of us, I hope. But it's uh, one we come across rather regularly, and the depths of it, of course, none of us, I think, ever really fathom. The Holy Father's always give us more depth than we imagined before, and a little bit greater insight into these passages as they were closer to God than any of us are. The well, several years back, well, probably pushing 20 now, I was privy to a conversation at the St. Chicons where a seminarian from another seminary, who is now a priest, a rather well-known priest who will remain nameless, went up to St. Chicons professor of Bible and Scripture, uh, Dr. Mary Ford, and they were having this discuss discussion on scriptural interpretation. The I guess a new priest at the time told him that the only way to interpret scripture was with scripture and the only way to interpret it was you had to know all the historical context and she said indeed those things are important they're very important but she started to give him the list of St. Maximus the Confessor who said put these about seventh or eighth on the list they are important but indeed the most important thing was purity of heart the most important thing was to follow the gospel of commandments, because no matter how much book learning one has, no matter how much historical context one has, no matter how much one can quote the scriptures, without purity of heart, it is just a dead document. With the purity of heart, one can discover many deep things from the holy scriptures. We have illiterate saints, or virtually illiterate, who knew the scriptures better than any of us, because their hearts were open to receive it. Our own St. Mary of Egypt knew the scriptures by heart without ever having heard them because she had been received them from the Holy Spirit and her purity that she lived in the desert. And that is a good lesson for us. So the Lord comes to these people. This is the way we are to know these parables. And he gives them a word. But he opens that word to all. And notice the most of the people he called are either fishermen or poor or illiterate not the strong of the world. But he doesn't close them out either. That word is given to them as well. Remember, he goes to a rich man. He talks to many people <clears throat> of power, Pharisees. But he gives them simple words, often words which they are not able to comprehend. And why is it they are not able to comprehend these words? St. Like Gregory Palamas said it's because of indifference, and it's because of clinging to worldly concerns too carefully, too much to worldly cares. And indeed, at all times, and sometimes all of us are a little bit indifferent, and at all times in some places we're a little bit too clinging to worldly cares, not thinking of the one thing needful, we get caught up in so many things that we fail to see Christ. But why does he speak to them in these parables? He gives them this passage, of course, from Isaiah, lest you know, seeing they see and perceive and hearing they hear and understand, it wasn't because he was hiding it from them. But the Lord does not force anything upon us. He does not force right knowledge upon us. He desires us to desire what he is saying. It is with free will that we are to approach the Lord. He opens that opportunity up to us to understand the scriptures. And he will not force himself because that's not real love. He wants us to love us for his own sake and to prepare our own hearts. He seeks a vessel that seeks him. He will not force himself into someone who does not want him, but he indeed does proclaim himself to them. The opportunities are not there, lest it was said they weren't preached to. They didn't hear that message. They did hear that message, and the word was given to them. So in these parables, he seeks someone who <clears throat> seeks the words of life, because those are the seed that he has scattered abroad. And so Peter says, you know, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's all that we have is the Lord's words. And the Lord gives us that great grace, but he seeks us to cultivate the land we might receive it. It is not the hearers of the word that are justified, but the doers. And so he seeks us to fulfill these things, he says, and if we aren't able to do that, it's probably better that he does tell to us in parables. So, when you look at this passage, what does the Lord do? It does first maybe not come to mind. He goes about and he casts the seed, because he indeed is the sower. He doesn't cultivate the land. He doesn't plow. He doesn't water in this parable. 
He throws out seed. The land has to be cultivated by us. We have to open our hearts to him first, and that's the synergy that we always talk about in the Orthodox Church, to cooperate with God, to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, as St. Paul tells us. And remember the words of John the Baptist, prepare ye the way of the Lord. The Lord is coming. You know. <coughs> Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Telling us to do something first. To get our hearts ready, because the Lord does not force himself once again upon any of us. But if we desire him, he will make that seed to grow forth up into eternal life for us. Of course, as he comes, that harvest is the second coming, when he sees what these folks have done. But which ones are we? Are we the ones that have received it by the wayside. It didn't have any roots. It was immediately was taken up away by the birds. So often we hear words of holiness, we hear the words of the services, we hear the words of the scripture, and we just go by along with our life and it doesn't affect us. But the words should be fresh and new every time. There's no parable that we've heard in this church that we've heard enough. To hear continually is still not gain enough out of it for us. We need to gain more and more and more. St. Gregory Palamasin, looking at this homily, not only does he see the birds, as many do as the demons, who come and snatch that word away from us with all these distractions, he had, a, I thought, a rather profound look at it and seeing it as idle talk and words of gossip and words that are useless that we all utter probably far too frequently in this society. Because when we utter those words, Whatever grace we gather is quickly withered away because we lose focus on Christ. So if we hear ourselves talking all the time, we've got to be careful because there's nothing quicker to losing our prayer by quick utterances of words without discernment. And certainly frivolous joking, things like that. When the world is too serious, when life is too serious, when our salvation is too serious, and we don't take it seriously enough, are we those who is landed among stones and rocks. For a little while we have a little bit of this, but in time of temptation we turn away. When things get a little difficult. How often do we hear, I don't understand why I'm having to struggle so much. I don't understand why things are so difficult. But that's the way that the Lord promised us. Precisely what he promised us. A cross, trials, in a difficult way in a way that he bore the yoke for us and carried with us and gave us strength. That hard ground becomes like a clay vessel which we have burned in a fire and doesn't have pores to let water in anymore. We have to have a little bit of porous ground, a little bit of porous clay in our hearts by gradually breaking it away with it with humility, with, of course, taking away our pride and looking at Christ to open up our hearts and turning to him only by that same profound humility that that water might seep in at the Holy Spirit. Are we those who have a little bit of grace and hear the word but are overwhelmed by cares of the world? And how easy that is to do. St. Gregory, in talking about this, likens it to a field which has received way too much water a bad kind of water in this case. And a plant can't grow, it is too saturated, it drowns it. So when we constantly are filling ourselves up, as I've said many times, in this world of institutionalized distraction, where everything is entertainment, everything is taking us away from God at every moment, it's very difficult to have ground that can constantly stay the course and keep on the path with Christ. It's amazing just when I'm out and about anymore how people can't go five seconds without looking at a phone. How many times a day they text, sitting across the table with each other at supper. This is not normal. This is not natural. It might be the new normal, but it is not God's normal. It's insane is what it is. Repeated insanity. We have to have grace from these things. We have to be able to open our hearts. We have to be able to listen to God's voice in our lives. We have to take away some of this distraction. If people lived for thousands of years before us without it, certainly we can live for a couple of minutes 
in a couple of days and be okay without these things. And our hearts begin to open gradually and practice them just a little bit. Let's be careful about the things that we put into the heart because, yes, Christ can fill us eternally in our hearts, but he's not going to come into a vessel that has idols of other sorts. We need to seek to be that good ground. To be that good ground, we need to cultivate it day after day after day. With prayer, with fasting, with attending church, with reading the scriptures, with giving alms, with loving our neighbor, by denying ourselves, and certainly by humility, 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 over and over again, humility. And realizing ourselves before God, our place before God, and how we need to act. So we take these examples and we cultivate our hearts. We look at the examples of these fathers on the icon in front of us who fought for that message of the incarnation, the holy icon, that God did indeed come in the flesh. And because of that, as I've said all too many times, nothing can remain the same. Everything has to be different. If Christ has come and Christ has risen, we can't walk forward from this second the same way we did a few seconds ago. Okay, we messed up in the past. The question is, what will you do now? It's not what you did yesterday. What will you do now? How will you live for the glory of God today? If I don't change, and then what? If I do change, and then what? If I do change, I will become a field fit for fruit, with flowers to blossom forth in my heart of the Holy Spirit. And this is what we must seek. This parable is fresh and new every time. And we, of course, go through the spectrum of those people over and over again, perhaps daily, perhaps by minute. But we must be gradually seeking to have that heart that can receive the seed that is the eternal word of God. Amen.